This is going to be a brief video, but it may be important for many of you, and there's a direct link to the peer-reviewed research in the description immediately below this video. There has been a groundbreaking new study into the nature of homosexuality. This is a landmark in the progress of science. However, like most groundbreaking new studies, it raises more questions than it answers. All right, this is not the final study on this topic. This is a study that's going to open a whole new avenue of research. And unfortunately, the people who are most adept at conducting research are very rarely the people who are able to communicate it to the public with or without the megaphone of the mainstream media. And in this case, the clearly written conclusions have managed to get garbled and misunderstood in being relayed to the public through the media. So that's why I'm making this video to clarify things. <clears throat> I heard this story for the first time from YouTuber DJ Vlad. Okay? It's had a huge impact on him. He's done a whole series of videos discussing the implications of this. But the story, as he tells it, is that this new research proves that there is no genetic basis to homosexuality. He claims that the proof is now that being gay is not in your DNA. And that is 180 degrees the opposite of what this study says. What the research scientists have said in interviews, and I've now seen this, short video clips, and what many of the newspapers are reporting in headlines, is that there is no single gene responsible for homosexuality, that there isn't one gene, okay? The study found five genes. Five genes that are statistically significant in their relationship to homosexuality. So I'm going to come back to what statistically significant means, what it may or may not mean here. I would just note, the first sentence of the conclusion is, quote, same-sex sexual behavior is influenced not by one or a few genes, but many. Okay, So the study is claiming to be the first step on the road to proving that there is a genetic basis for homosexuality. They want to suggest, and they're, as always with peer-reviewed scientific reports, they're very careful in their wording because they're not allowed to speculate. But they want to suggest that the five autosomal loci that they identified, the five genes, if you like, that they identified are not the only genes responsible. That's just what they were able to identify here. They speculate, in effect, that there will be more genes responsible. However, in looking into those five, I just note, <clears throat> in 2019, most genetic research, all that you can identify is a marker. And then you often don't know that much about what the genetic marker does. And in some cases, the genetic marker may do nothing. We have genetic code that isn't uh, exhibited in our appearance or how we live. It's just code we carry with us in our DNA. However, in this case, the five genetic markers that they did identify as statistically significant are linked to sex hormone regulation and olfaction. Okay? So olfaction has something to do with the sense of smell. Right? Sense of smell and sex hormones obviously are related to uh, human sexual behavior. Now, I, I assume they probably used the, the word olfaction they might not have wanted to specify. They may not know precisely what the function of the DNA is in relation to uh, emitting smell, perceiving smell, what it is that, that it does more precisely. And generally in 2019, when you're talking about a specific gene, we know a little bit about it, but it's, it's not the case that we just have a simple checklist for the function of, of every gene in the gene. We know, we know something. Um, but very often, that's why people talk about genetic markers. We've found that one gene is significant in relation to a specific condition, like a specific health problem, but that gene probably impacts 10 other things in the body, and we, we may only know one out of 10. That's the way it goes in 2019. 
Okay? Um, so the claim in the study is, quote, the genetic effects that differentiate heterosexual from same-sex sexual behavior are not the same as those that differ among non-heterosexuals with lower versus higher proportions of same-sex partners. Close quote. That's about as clear as mud, right? It's very difficult to follow what it's saying there. So they're narrowing down further the statistical significance of what they have discovered so far. They're telling you they found five genetic markers that are statistically significant when you're comparing a population. There's enormous number of people in this genetic survey, huge, huge number of uh, people. In the, it's uh, by a factor of 100 to 1. This is the largest DNA survey of its kind ever on the subject of homosexuality. So the, the orders of magnitude here are huge compared to any earlier study on the relationship between DNA and sexual behavior of this kind. Um, but they're narrowing down the claim about statistical significance. These five genes, they are statistically significant when you compare the category of completely heterosexual people to the category of people who are in any way gay, lesbian, or bisexual. So some of those bisexual people, it could be a man who's married to a woman, but in his whole life, just a couple of times, just once in a while, he's had some kind of same-sex relationship, okay? And of course, it'll include also people who have all their lives completely been devoted to just same-sex relationships. So there's a warning here about the statistical significance, what it means and what it doesn't. And this is again why they're hinting, look, we haven't found one gene, and they want to emphasize that they don't think these five genes are, are final or the end of the st story. Finding these five genes, it's going to be significant enough that they can now apply for more funding and they can do more research and, and move forward with this. That'll establish a path to future research. It'll establish a really strong basis for more research. Okay, but This is not an open and shut case. However, at this time, the science of sexuality has taken a huge step forward. When I was a kid, the main news about homosexuality was that the research into hormone levels proved nothing. People were expecting to find hormonal differences for people who were gay versus people who were straight, and it came to nothing. Like basically, it was a dead end in terms of research. Then people wanted to do MRI research on the brain and research on the shape of the brain stem, and they thought they'd be able to find structural, structural features of the brain that uniquely linked to uh, homosexuality, and it came to nothing. And if you Google it today, there are still really strongly disagreeing papers on that. There are people who are still trying to argue that there's some structural features of the brain that gay men have and straight men don't. It's hotly contested, but at best you can say it's inconclusive. Within my lifetime so far, that line of research came to nothing. And the genetic studies, as of about 15 years ago, the state it got to was they had found nothing by examining homosexual men themselves, lesbian women themselves, but they had managed to find one suggestion of a marker. They managed to find something significant when they looked at the DNA of the mothers of homosexual men. And that was the first faint hope that they'd eventually find something in the DNA that actually relates to homosexuality, okay? So this is a huge fundamental change in the way science perceives homosexuality. And the scientists involved, they have wanted to tone this down and reassure everyone. <laughs> they want to avoid rioting. They want to avoid uh, political upheaval. Okay? But in trying to tone this down and dilute the significance of this news, unfortunately, they've managed to obfuscate their scientific findings to such an extent that it's being reported in the mainstream press, some, not all, but it's being reported by some journalists, and it's being misinterpreted by people like DJ Vlad, shout out to DJ Vlad, it's being misinterpreted by them as if the conclusions were the exact opposite of what they are. Okay? So the conclusions are, there is not just one piece of DNA, there is not just one genetic marker that tells you the difference between gay and straight. They have found five so far. 
and they don't think those five are the whole story. They think if they do further research, they're going to find several more, and then they're going to have to unravel the way in which those markers relate with each other. So you can imagine, even if there were five, maybe someone who has all five of those markers is different than someone who just has three out of the five. Maybe there's a whole range of forms of sexuality or inclinations that correspond to the, the five uh, strings of DNA we're looking at so far. And as they keep hinting again and again, maybe it is much more complex than what they have thus far developed. However, in 2019, for the first time, we're looking at a genetic basis for homosexuality, whereas in the past, we failed to find a hormonal basis for it. We failed to find a, a basis in terms of the structure of the brain. We failed to find a physiological or simplistic mechanistic explanation for it. People have been looking all over the world for some little shred of evidence like this. And you know what? The progress of science staggers back and forth. It's possible in the next five years there will be a new study that controverts and contradicts these findings. But right now, as of this moment, the indication is that there is a genetic basis that people are born straight or born gay.